Copy, record. So decentralized finance. Um, I it's it's a big playground. It's a very uh, open space where anyone, uh, regardless whether you have any finance um, assets or not, can play. Um, so traditional finance is very limited, very safeguarded by regulations, by jurisdictions and by big money. If you don't have uh, big pockets, usually you have very limited amount of um, uh, innovative power of what you can do. Uh, and decentralized finance opened it up. Uh, it completely changed the landscape in terms of financial services and how some people perceive what finance is for. Uh, and how it works. And I kind of like this phrase that it's uh, anybody like kids, mostly young people playing with a lot of ideas and trying things out from home, even if you don't have any uh, any money, even if you don't have any investment. So you can actually try out a lot of things and a lot of successful decentralized finance projects and protocols have been invented by students, by young people uh, with no backing, with no actual big, you know, investments or big investor rounds. Uh, so that is quite, quite interesting. Um, so we have 195 countries and each country have their own national currencies, minus some countries which use uh, US dollar or yeah, like in Europe, some countries use a single currency like Euro. Uh, but in general, we have kind of um, roughly speaking 200 national currencies, more or less. Uh, and that seems to be quite a lot already, right? So when you're traveling, you are already have a bit of an issue with um, with converting from one country to another, with the conversion rates and so on. And the question is, why don't we just have one currency, for example, uh, which would kind of uh, unify everything? And the answer is quite complicated. Um, the, the reason why we don't have a single currency is because different currencies are for different purposes. Um, so most national currencies uh, and the purpose is not only to facilitate transactions between people uh, to exchange goods and, and services, but also in a form of control. Uh, so, you know, the country level finances came from kings and, and, and so on back in the day where they were fin financing uh, wars and, and, and so on. And they had to do debt against um, like a national debt against the people such that they could, could finance something right now and then pay it later on. Um, so most national currencies, currencies are a form of debt management. Um, and the countries are using it for control. Uh, but that's not only, like we're not using financial transactions only for uh, national currencies. We're using it, for example, to fund companies like you know Microsoft or Apple, and then we have stocks. And stocks is a form of uh, financial asset, which is different to national currencies. And we have kind of many of those as well. So if you, um, I, I kind of ran this presentation before, so you don't need to sign up and answer questions because they are kind of already answered. Um, so we, like when I ran this presentation last time, um, there were more than 250,000, uh, I mean, 25,000 currencies. And, uh, and I've been running it for a couple of years. And, you know, initially the correct answer was here. Then we moved to here, to here, to here, and then I stopped. I said, okay, th th there is no point doing the, the quiz anymore because, um, and I've been using, um, I've been using a coin market cap, which is like a overview of the uh, cryptocurrency space. And it lists all the cryptocurrencies with the market capitalization. And it used to differentiate, um, cryptos in two categories and I was tracking the kind of the smaller category and right now it says it's like 2.2 million of different cryptocurrencies uh, which is partially true but some of those are not uh, actually currencies they are like uh, NFTs or some uh, non-transferable kind of uh, tokens so the number jumped up because if you count some things that are unique like uh, NFTs Suddenly, you know, you you have a quickly a very large number. 
because each of the coin is very unique, right? So this number is, uh, you know, somewhat misleading, but there is a huge number of um, cryptocurrencies uh, which exist and they are created very rapidly. Uh, and if you go to highlights, um, they, they have some, they have a statistic of how many new tokens have been kind of generated in the last 24 hours. And that number is huge. <laughs> so every day there is like a lot of people who are setting up new projects and, and creating new, most likely shit coins, uh, which will be worth nothing in a couple of months or, you know, but some projects have became extremely successful. Um, so the two most successful projects is Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum, uh, but Solana is like a really successful uh, project, which is relatively recent. Um, Binance Chain is a commercial chain, which is uh, borrowing all the code base from Ethereum, but it's owned by Binance. And that became very quickly, very successful as well. Um, so there is you know, quite a large number of um, projects that have been um, for a while and they have been solid. Uh, some, if you go really down, you have um, like down more than thousand, right? Uh, you will see that the coins are pretty worthless and they are pretty dodgy. So you can, uh, you can see that some of the coins are just for fun. Some of the coins are a joke. Um, and so on, and some are just scams. So majority is kind of a long tail and majority of what is actually happening is probably, yeah, nonsense. But some of it makes makes sense. So we will kind of focus on, on what makes sense. So the last time I've checked, uh, and it was in February 23, uh, we had 21,000 currencies uh, and the numbers were growing, like you see the, um, how quickly the, the growth was happening. So if we kind of do a bit of a um, search for um, mnemonics, which are the uh, three or four letter um, coins, uh, last time I ran it, the students were kind of doing some of the coins that they knew. Um, Questions, yeah, to the moon, yes, exactly. So most of it, yeah. So Rackpool, we'll learn a little bit about it later. Uh, Rackpool is one of the common techniques for uh, scamming people. Um, and speculation is, yeah, um, another mechanism for greedy people to get scammed. <laughs> uh, so there is a lot of abuse and there is a lot of um, uh, bad things happening. Uh, and I personally think that by regulating it, by saying some of it is regulated, um, the people who don't know uh, get scammed actually more. If you, um, if you let people play with it with the risk of being completely losing everything, then a lot of people wouldn't do it. Uh, but because there is certain amount of regulation, it pretends that there is some sort of security, which there isn't. Um, honestly, there is no security for none of the coins. Um, but yeah, we have the, the the space where you know which we have. So Litecoin is uh, yeah. I have some trivia questions. So Litecoin is uh, um, it's almost as old as Bitcoin. It has been quite quickly released after Bitcoin. It did two things differently. It, it used different methods for a proof of work, different algorithm, and it has a larger um, uh, larger supply. So it has, um, yeah, so Bitcoin has 21 million uh, total supply, roughly speaking, and 84 million is Litecoin. So the supply for Litecoin is, is the third number. Yeah, that's me paragliding. I <laughs> included some uh, paragliding photos to uh, smooth the the sailing of the of the lecture. Uh, this this has been in um, southern Spain, 
uh, and me is I am in the middle and I'm flying with my friends over. Uh, it's kind of undulating terrain and it goes all the way to Ronda and then we are facing south and then you have the Adriatic uh, at, at the end. I've been going there for many years and only this year because of the unusual hot summer and unusual hot conditions, people were actually able to reach the Adriatic coast. And now there is a bet. People like put some uh, euro in and there is like a pool of money if you go from from Algodonales all the way to Adriatic and back, you win like thousand euros because all the pilots were like betting that it is like it, like a couple of years ago, that would not be possible at all, but somehow the weather changes and the equipment is better. So people can do this long cross country flights. Anyway, um, what is DeFi? So uh, there is a kind of interesting, um, um phenomenon so most of the defi talk uh in public media is about either bitcoin being really uh burning a lot of electricity and that being very environmentally unfriendly or that it is used by criminals to launder money and do a lot of bad things which both which are true um both of those concerns are true um um whoa <laughs> that's interesting um all right so um in february 2022 so two years ago there has been a protest uh of truckers because i i let, let's not go into the politics just that the um um People were unhappy about something and they were protesting and the government decided to block their accounts and seize all their funds in order to force them to do what the government wanted them to do. Uh, so instead of actually using force, in which is in some kind of authoritarian countries, the, the rule uh, by physical force, they use a kind of an economical power of locking all the accounts and seizing all the funds such that they couldn't go and buy food, right? Uh, and therefore forcing people to, to do whatever the government wanted them to do. Uh, and that begs a question whether protesting people um, should be subjected to this type of um, enforcement uh, because they, they were not prosecuted. They were not strictly speaking criminals uh, they were just protesting against some of the government um, regulations or something that they didn't agree with. Um, so there was not like th th that is sort of like a normal people protesting. And then the governments have the power of actually enforcing something by taking all the assets. So if you went to work and then earned money and then at some point you have unpopular views, which the government doesn't agree with the government can seize all the wealth that you had uh, without like criminal case, right? That, that, that is the point. Like, of course, if, if, if you turn, if it turned out that you did something illegal and you are prosecuted and convicted, then I totally agree that seizing your assets or putting you in jail or seizing your freedom is fine. But without all, any of this, is it fine for governments to have control over your own assets? And many uh, libertarians and many people say, no, that's not fine. That that should not be the case. Uh, but it is the case. So the case is that um, the central authority managing the, the funds can do this. And the funny thing is that the cryptocurrencies and the uh, digital currencies can be a kind of a balancing technology, which allows people to retain ownership and control, but it can also be a mechanism for central banks to have even more control and uh, even more uh, control over people's assets. We will discuss it later when we talk about um, central currencies being issued by central banks 
Um, it's kind of a, a very interesting topic. Um, it, it, it kind of relates to programmable money. Um, so Norwegian government is also investigating it. They have ongoing projects of what can and cannot be done and how it could work and to what level can people have a certain level of privacy and uh, an uh, anonymity and self-control. And at some level, things are kind of actually programmed and can be controlled. So for example, if you... If you have a wallet and you're a minor and you go and try to buy alcohol, the actual on the protocol level, it will be kind of forbidden for you to buy alcohol, right? So it, it will not be enforced by any checks. It's just that money will not be able to leave your wallet from your wallet to the a monopoly kind of um, uh, mono, uh, the, the liquor store, right? And you can actually program it on the protocol level. Um, so that the programmable money kind of offers the government even more control to what they currently have. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, projects like Bitcoin, for example, offer a certain amount of um, uh, authority to the to the owners. So it, it's a double uh, edged sword. Uh, and uh, yeah, we kind of need to dig deeper a little bit to to understand it. So then there was like so so. Uh, People basically had their fiat money seized, right? So the, the normal bank accounts were blocked and their funds could be seized by, by central authority. Some of those money, some of those protesters have Bitcoin and they kept Bitcoin in some exchanges like Kraken. And then uh, the Kraken CEO basically said this. Um, that if the government tell them to seize their bank, they they money, uh, they will do it. So he said, yes, they will. Um, uh, they will be forced by regulations to seize everybody's money if there is a, an order to do that uh, and they cannot protect you, right? So the, the centralized exchanges holding people's Bitcoins work the same as normal banks. So if there is a uh, order for seizure or order for block blocking accounts, they will do it. So he basically said, and, and he's the CEO of the biggest... Um, uh, U.S. cryptocurrency, get your coins and and keep them in P2P wallets, keep them in your own wallets and do P2P only, right? So he was advocating that if you care about your own privacy and your own funds being at your disposal, you should not trust the centralized um, exchanges. You should kind of go into the P2P. Uh, and that was quite spectacular. So that has happened two years ago and that kind of started... Um, uh, quite a quite a discussion. Um, so uh, Christian is saying the Norwegian central bank is looking into creating a central bank currency using cryptocurrency technology. Um, yeah, so it is kind of a contradictory, uh, and it will not really be P2P uh, in a sense of uh, multiple nodes validating transactions and so on. It will probably be yeah, a kind of a central database with a single authority kind of managing it, but they're looking into it. Like they're looking how it will how it will work. Um, and some uh, some of the properties will allow people to trade peer to peer. Uh, but some of the things will have to be validated by, you know, centralized uh, services. So it is ongoing work. They don't know yet um, how it may work. And my feeling is that the, they they mostly looking into what might happen and what is possible. They will probably not do anything until it is deployed everywhere else in Europe. Uh, so they are quite conservative in terms of um, um, uh, yeah, adapt, adapting the technology, but they kind of need to know what it means. Like if other countries are doing it, what it means for transparency and for it means for money flows. So there is kind of a, an interest in, in investigating it. So yeah, this is what sort of uh, DeFi protocols do you know? Uh, I think you can answer this one. If you know any protocols, or maybe I didn't got any responses last time. Uh, let, let's move on. Uh, so we will have some examples of uh, decentralized protocols. Yeah, Uniswap, great. So that's one of the most popular uh, and also widely successful protocols. 
uh, which is used for currency exchange. We will dive a little bit into currency exchanges later, uh, but it is a decentralized um, automated market maker exchange, which became widely, widely successful. Um, all right, so very quick overview of a tr of a traditional banking system. So if Bob wants to pay money to Alice um, and you're doing it through uh, money transfer or some form of electronic money transfer, you sort of have intermediary in the middle, which you have to trust with your funds and then Alice will kind of uh, get the funds. Uh, the, the, the problem is that it's not that simple. Uh, you do have brokers and you do have kind of a gateways all, all along the way. And every time you, you're crossing a boundary, often the service providers are charging you fees. And it's not uncommon for kind of international money transfers to be going through like seven to 12 different service providers. And each of them takes a little bit of money and then your fee gets, you know, to 15% or 20%. Um, so there, you know, there is, there are some inefficiencies in the current banking system, but more or less it kind of works like this. Um, the exception is cash, uh, which many countries around the world are trying to eliminate, uh, because if Bob has cash, he can pay Alice directly, right? In a P2P fashion. Um, so cash is sort of decentralized, even though it is centrally issued, but uh, it is managed kind of outside of the central banking system to, to, to an extent, uh, because it allows people to trade directly while maintaining anonymity and while maintaining some um, uh, privacy and uh, ownership of their funds. So if all the trackers kept their earnings in cash, then they would retain this sort of... Um, privacy plus ownership of the funds uh, without um, the government being able to seize it. But it is kind of cumbersome, right? You can't really keep um, all your money as cash. And also there is a lot of limitations. If you, if you, for example, go to a car dealer and you say, yep, I have buckets of cash, they wouldn't sell you a car, actually. They would say, no, no, we, you have to pay by bank transfer. <laughs> we cannot accept cash. Uh, the same is for house purchases and so on. So there are certain things which by law you cannot buy by cash anymore. It used to be that it didn't matter, but by right now it, it is not actually possible. It has to be done by bank transfer. The same with certain uh, transactions. You could think, yep, I can make this transaction with cash, but actually the law says, no, you cannot. You have to have it through a banking system. Um, Anyway, uh, so if we replace the central uh, trusted authority with, uh, if we replace this kind of a service uh, which relies on human custodians with algorithms, uh, what would happen? Uh, so that's what uh, Nick Shabo did. Like he kind of pro proposed that some in some places where we rely on human-centered institutions or human-centered uh, services, we could um, replace it with a machine or an algorithm and it, it would retain the same kind of a privacy or it, it not, not, not retain, it would kind of enhance the privacy and um, um, robustness of the system because it would, stop relying on kind of a human decision making, right? And he coined the term smart contracts and he gave an example of a vending machine being sort of like a idiomatic smart contract where you basically have kind of um, a transaction happening between me and the machine, which has a drink and I want to buy a drink. And then without kind of a human in the middle, I can go through the process of purchasing the drink by uh, paying for it and then getting the drink, the drink physically to, to my hand. And I don't need a sort of a, an intermediary. I can actually do it directly with the machine, right? Uh, I don't need like a human uh, shop attendant kind of selling me the drink, giving me the drink. It can kind of happen automatically. Um, 
And he said that for many things that would make things more efficient, it would make things more safe and it would make things more private. Um, so that kind of started the, the investigations and the analysis of what is possible. And we ended up with the current iteration of smart contracts kind of implemented mostly in the Ethereum virtual machine, kind of demonstrating what is possible and what is not possible. Of course, with the vending machine, some things can go wrong, right? If the if someone unplugs the vending machine after I paid, probably I'm gonna lose my money or something. So that it, it's not like it eliminates uh, all possible externalities and makes it like perfect. Uh, we never gonna have that, but it limits certain externalities to uh, it, to a subset which is smaller than in the case of the shop, right? Um, so that's his paper. Um, it's very simple paper. You, I kind of um, encourage you to to check it out. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So there are some limits of how much certain uh, cash operations has, has happened. Right, so the idea was that you do have this um, mutually trusted party, uh, which is trusted by all those participants. And by sending those secret outputs and inputs, you basically achieve a certain amount of um, uh, secrecy uh, without, and, and without sacrificing the usability or sacrificing the functionality of the middle, right? So you do, um, instead of having this sort of a mutually trusted party, you, you, you replace it with um, algorithms and with protocols such that actually you have the same situation without the, the trust being put into something. The, you only kind of are trusting the, um, the behavior of the protocols themselves. Um, so there is nobody who is kind of at fault um, or who can kind of manipulate something in the middle. Yeah, it's a little bit abstract, let's let's move on. So it will become kind of uh, easier when, when we discuss it further. So we kind of replacing the human-centric uh, human institution with a um, system that is based on algorithms and, and math mathematical proofs such that whatever was the intention is actually achieved by those algorithms or those um, those technological uh, protocols which are kind of in the middle. So you can now transfer money between the accounts without actually taking the, um, the money into a custody of a third party. So you have... Um, you have replaced the trust in the trusted third party with the trust you give into the protocols uh, or kind of a technology which is in the middle now. So can Bitcoin be such a trusted computer? And the, in general sense, no. Uh, it can be for money transfer, for like a funds transfer, but in general case, it cannot do certain things because the script which the Bitcoin transactions use is not Turing complete and there are certain limitations of what you can and cannot do in terms of um, smart contracts which are based on the Bitcoin script, right? Uh, we're going to discuss it a little bit more later, um, but that's why... Generally, the answer is no. Um, so what um, what other technology could facilitate this kind of a trusted computer? And I've already spoiled it. So um, EVM or Ethereum uh, was the first technology which was able to do this. Uh, and the first kind of um, application was, yeah, decentralized finance. Um, so what is decentralized finance? Well, in the simplest case, it's about payments or um, remittance. Yeah, so... Yeah, so the laws are designed, so there is a bit of a discussion happening about um, the 
the rules and regulations. We will cover some of it later as well. Um, most of the regulations are to prevent um, misuse or to prevent some of the bad uh, actors abusing the system. Um, but uh, they are also for control, uh, for the kind of a central authority oversight of what is happening. Uh, nobody wants to kind of let take the hands off and say, yep, uh, I, I don't want control. I don't want the power to, to enforce certain things. Uh, obviously, central authorities and governments kind of need that. Um, but it, it is kind of a, a balancing act, right? Um, there is a very interesting... Um, um, there is a very interesting... Uh, approach so that there is that kind of a two approaches one is uh saying that you can do everything unless it harms somebody and then if if whatever you're doing kind of harms somebody you will be prosecuted but it's not specified what it is it's up to the courts to decide whether there was harm and if it was you're gonna get punished for it for doing something that harms somebody else right and th th that creates kind of a market, or so that creates um, uh, spaces where things are very unregulated, but they are controlled um, by this simple mechanism of, um, uh, you know, harming or non-harming somebody, right? So and th those systems tend to have kind of a very small set of, of, of regulations or rules. And the enforcement of, of law or, or, or the kind of a social order is enforced by the lawsuits. So every time somebody tries to do something that harms others, those those others kind of um, complain and make the court case, and then the the situation is fixed because the perpetrator or whoever was kind of causing harm is being kind of uh, put to justice, uh, and that works for example for commerce or for um like business services right uh, we don't have a law saying yeah you cannot do this business or this business or this business we say yeah you can do whatever you want you can try to come up with whatever businesses you can dream of as long as you don't harm or create certain problems and then if you do then there is a lawsuit and then you have to correct your your actions right so that's one category of dealing with um legal kind of um setting up the legal constraints the other one is regulating by specifying exactly what can and cannot be done right and what happens is in the second case the bad actors will follow the rules but they will still exploit the rules to take advantage of the system and they will claim that they don't do anything illegal because they do follow the rules, right? So it's like meta gaming in games, right? If you um, if you have kind of a game and you are gaming the game, uh, then are you violating the rules? Not not necessarily. You're kind of following the rules, but you're kind of making, you know, you you you're generating some harm, uh, but. You cannot be prosecuted because it, it the law clearly says what can and cannot be done, right? And those systems tend to go into more and more rules and more and more nuanced laws, and eventually societies which are based on the second system kind of actually collapse because the law becomes so complicated and so cumbersome that nobody actually understands what can and cannot be happening because you know, for every single thing that has been abused had to be an exception and blah, blah, blah. And it becomes kind of um, overly complex. So the complexity kind of goes into the rules. Whereas in the first case, the complexity goes into the law cases and you have to review what has been trialed before and what people lost and won. And then you kind of make new, new judgments, right? And unfortunately in finance, the industry went into the second mostly by lobbying, right? Because for people who are in the finance industry, it is much better to have the regulations and have the rules which they can violate, um, which, which they can follow and violate the kind of the nuance of the rules such that they don't break the rules, but they still benefit from doing something kind of on edge of the of, of harm, so to say, right? Um, 
so yeah that that's right so there is um there is more nuance about that right so it's it's kind of a generalization um let's let's go back to the um, to finance right so we have payments um we have ability to take loans or to give loans uh, micro loans and flash loans we're gonna talk about them as well um there is a lot of uh, services and providers for insurance uh which is also a very interesting topic in its in itself um investment speculations and savings uh so for example um keeping value over a longer term uh this is difficult the but it has been part of decentralized finance too uh hedging risk uh or betting on on certain events in the future like prediction markets and very efficient price discovery um so all those things kind of already happened and they are continuously being um reinvented or redone through decentralized finance but we cannot discuss everything so what we will do is we will discuss loans and flash loans and we will talk a little bit about investment um and maybe i will pre prepare a future lecture about prediction markets because that is a, a quite an interesting topic as well but those are kind of topics you can read on your own and um, if you're interested so uh there are some obvious problems with cryptocurrencies so the the, the most obvious for in, in the case of bitcoin for example is its uh, price volatility um you cannot really know what the price of bitcoin will be like next week so would you take a loan in bitcoin uh, no really because it's very kind of um high risk endeavor it, it's like gambling actually because if you take a loan today in bitcoin you don't know if the price of the bitcoin will be so high next week that you, you will not be able to pay it back or if the price will be so low that it's very ineffective for the loan giver to actually lend you bitcoin right so you have kind of a problems with volatility uh of the of the value and then some of the chains most notably uh ethereum and bitcoin they have quite high transaction fees so they are quite inefficient for doing micro transactions where you have to pay somebody a couple of cents um because it would cost you a couple of dollars to make a couple of cents transaction right um which is the same problem with the it's the same problem with the traditional finance and for example in africa where people deal with very small amounts of uh, money transfers for purchases and so on uh what what came about to be kind of a de facto standard was the mobile phone payments on over mobile phone credits um because the mobile oper operators can do a very like it costs them effectively nothing if 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 i and bob are with the same uh, network provider let, let's say we are with tel um telecom uh and i have i don't know 100 krona and uh, bob has 500 krona on, on the account and now bob says i want to transfer 10 krona to marius for the telco operator it's just like a you know two uh, two numbers change in the database of how much credit I have and how much credit Bob has, right? So the transaction cost for the network operator is extremely small, uh, such that they can offer this kind of a money transfer, um, you know, IOU uh, transactions at extremely, uh, you know, uh, extremely cheap rates. And the M money um, or mobile money in, in Africa or some kind of a developing countries became kind of a de facto way of, of transacting um, because the, the banking system was too inefficient and too um, costly, right? But the similar problems we have with Bitcoin or Ethereum, for example. So there has been a, a work on stable currencies, which, um, which has which have property the same as cryptocurrencies, but they maintain the they pegged value to another currency. Uh, so if I have a currency which is kind of pegged to Norwegian krona or to euro, um, I have kind of a future 
resilience to the value change because it is kind of uh, backed by the economy of a given country or a, or economy of a given currency and then it kind of maintains a kind of a stable exchange rate and they have been a couple of successful um stable coins which we will discuss next so the question is aren't some cryptos made to be just to, to just be the middleman for like banks when they don't do the transactions but not actually for private use um that is true so xrp is sort of like this and uh there is actually a discussion whether the uh, centrally issued cryptocurrencies in some countries will be kind of a consumer facing they will be able for uh, normal people to be used or only for the banking system to kind of do the cross um uh, settling of the of the accounts yeah that that is uh, it's a good question and they have um discussed that that some of the cryptocurrencies are not to be kind of a consumer facing they so, should be like business to business type um LTC has very low transaction fees. That's also a very good point. Um, and then, yeah, then there was discussion about the rules. Right, so there is a question from Ivan about Terra, Terra Luna. Um, yes, we're going to discuss it a little bit more. Um, So pegging and stable currencies, they can be done in different ways. Um, so currency pegged to another currency is what the, the stability comes from. So one asset is kind of pegged to another asset. And that can happen on um, uh, through different mechanisms, right? So why do we use them? Uh, because it is much easier to, especially the stable coins pegged to national currencies, they are much easier to integrate as a payment um, mechanism uh, they combat inherent volatility of the currencies of the cryptocurrencies um, they are much better for loans or for payments um, and they kind of facilitate much better integration with this common virtual computer right with this uh, middle middle layer uh, because of, of the lack of those fluctuations um, and then there are different examples um, there is an, an example in Poland, um, which is called OPLN. Uh, it's a very unsuccessful, not much used uh, currency packed to Polish Zloty. And that has been released by a crypto um, money exchange uh, chain. So there is a big kind of a exchange chain and they, <clears throat> they issued kind of um, currency with one-to-one -one pegging it, it in a very similar fashion as USDT. So USDT has been done in the same way where they have a certain amount of money locked for the pegging and then they issue the, uh, the equivalent crypto, right? So if you buy uh, 100 PLN worth of OPLN, you get OPLN and they keep the PLN, right? So it's it's kind of like a banking system, right? And then the question is, how safe is that? Like how much deposits do they have? If everybody suddenly wants to convert OPLN to PLN, can they do it? Or will the company go bankrupt, right? But those questions are the same with the traditional banking system because the banking system, when they give loans, they don't have... Um, um, they don't have necessarily the same amount of deposits in their vaults, right? So there is a certain ratio um, and the ratio historically used to be, you know, one to one many, many years ago, but uh, over the years, the, the pressures and the lobbying kind of pushed the regulations to allow them to have more and more riskier ratio. And in some jurisdictions, the ratio is like one to five. So you actually have five times more money in the market than you have to own to kind of uh, balance it, right? Um, and then bad things happen. Suddenly, if more people uh, want to, you know, uh, fold, then 
the other side is not compensating sufficiently. Um, right, so yes, there is a question about Monero. Uh, so the yeah, there is an interesting um, there is an interesting kind of a uh, computer scientist uh, story behind the the cryptocurrency because the uh, the the guy who invented the protocol was not the guy who actually did the coin uh, and he never really benefited from the from the invention so to say. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, coming back to to stable currencies. Um, we have, uh, so I will do the uh, the the two two main types, and then we'll have a short break. So we do have um, uh, stability coming from the assets being kind of locked, uh, and they are controlled by the kind of a custodian service. So USDT and USDC are examples of that, where they have one to one enforced mapping, and OPLN is also following this by the custodian service. So the trust comes from this central bank or the central custodian service, which manages the, the mapping. And then they guarantee that you can always exchange one-to-one, -one, let's say USDT to, uh, to US dollar. So you can go to them and you can sell your USDT or USDC back to US dollar, right? Um, so those custodian services are managed by someone who is offering this guarantee of converting your money both ways, right? And the stability comes from this mapping. So the stability actually comes from them enforcing this, this mapping. By doing the transactions with them, you may need to pay a small fee, right? So it's not like you're going to get one USDT for one US dollar and back without actually paying a small fee, uh, but more or less, like if, if you disregard the, the small amount of fee, then the mapping is one-to-one. -one. And it also uh, is done for other, uh, for other assets. So you can also get uh, robbed BTC or robbed Ether uh, by locking in a certain um, asset and then Again, disregarding small fees for doing the transactions, you have um, a conversion back to Ether or back to BTC. If you deposit your BTC, you get the ROP BTC. And then if you uh, give back the ROP BTC, you get your original BTC back, right? So the, the ROPing of Ether or BTC is sort of um, following the same way, but the role of the... Um, the role of the custodian is taken up sometimes by the smart contract uh, instead of a centralized service. So this, this model can be either done by a centralized services, uh, banks or exchanges or, or things like this, uh, or it can be done in a decentralized way, but also by kind of a locking and unlocking some funds on both sides of the, of the equation. And those tend to be subject for majority of DeFi, DeFi attacks, because as you can imagine, if I have a smart contracts, let's say, which converts uh, Ether to robbed Ether, for people to use the robbed Ether, they have to lock the Ether and the locked contracts actually end up having quite a, they are sort of like uh, value pots. They have a lot of assets stored there um, because uh, like in this case of the human custodians, uh, the mapping, we don't know if the mapping is one-to-one, -one. like there, there has been a lot of speculations about USDT that they don't actually have um, enough deposits to cover all the USDT in the, um, you know, in, in the market, uh, which they don't. Uh, but for those, usually it, the mapping is one to one, right? So if, if we have a market of like 1 billion robbed Ether, that means that there is 1 billion of Ether locked somewhere. And then the attackers try to circumvent um, protections and try to steal it, right? So there is a lot of attacks for those um, smart contract based gateways, which allow um, issuance of those um, stable currencies locked to another uh, cryptocurrency. 
And then there is a more interesting um, uh, stable coin, which comes from uh, algorithmic stability. And this has two um, uh, possible implementations. Uh, one, which is an example of MakerDAO, so we will talk about it after the break. Uh, and the other, which is not, um, which is similar, but is actually looking at the demand and supply and trying to adjust the price and trying to maintain the stability the same way as normal currencies are, are stable, right? So how stable are, are normal currencies? Well, they are quite stable, but, you know, for example, if you go to knock to euro, uh, you can see that, you know, uh, it's not a straight line, right? Uh, why it is not a straight line? Well, because there is a difference between supply and demand. If there is more demand for Norwegian krona, the value of the Norwegian krona will go up. But if there is less demand and people are selling it, like they don't want to hold Norwegian krona, but they want to keep euro, then the euro value goes up and Norwegian krona goes down. So the stability is not a straight line. Um, and it's sort of a supply and demand regulated, right? Uh, so if you look at the um, USDT, USD. so this one, is it's not a perfect straight line, but you can see that fluctuations are on the fourth decimal place. So it's like the the hundredth of cent, uh, and that basically are the fees. So the fees differ depending on whether more people want to buy or more people want to sell, but the, the fluctuations are kind of on the fourth decimal place of the value, right? Whereas in the case of Norwegian Krona, it is um yeah it is the the third <laughs> decimal place in in the krona case but it's because it is um yeah norwegian krona is worth very little uh but if if you take like let's say take pln yeah if we take pln then it is usually on the second uh, second decimal place. Yeah, anyway, uh, getting a straight line is kind of hard. Um, and the su supply and demand stability turned out to be possible, but also hard. Um, there was one project uh, three or four years ago in the US, uh, which was trying it out, but they were stopped by the by the feds uh, because um, there were some legal problems with actually doing it the way they wanted to do it. Uh, not, not on the technology level, but on the kind of a legal thing. So we didn't have so far an example of a successful deployment uh, that it's like a theoretical. Um, this the second model of our algorithmic stability based on the supply demand, but we do have MakerDAO, which is um, uh, regulated through incentive mechanisms, and that has proven to be pretty successful and pretty stable. So let's, yeah, let's have a short break. So let's let's go back to to the, uh, yeah. Let's go back to the stable coins uh, and MakerDAO. So MakerDAO is a project which has been actually uh, designed and uh, brought to life by a Danish entrepreneur, uh, so Scandinavia. Ooh, um, and it has been very successful uh, over the last um, years. And the idea is um, the idea is quite simple. So. The idea is that what they the original idea was to issue a stable currency called DAI, which will be packed to US dollar and one to one mapping. And it will be done by um, locking deposit uh, whose value is larger than the the DAI which is issued. And the stable currency here is combined with loan service. So if you have Ether, 
you can basically take uh, a certain loan in the stable cryptocurrency, uh, use it for buying, you know, milk or bread, and then you will have to pay it back. Um, and it is done uh, like this. So if you have one Ether and the Ether, let's assume is worth a uh, hundred dollars, then you saying, um, you kind of are locking it into the collateral deposit box. Um, so, so this is like a collateralized deposit um, where it became kind of a collateral of your loan. So, and there is a certain ratio of, of risk of how much the deposit needs to be larger than the money you're getting as a loan. And in this case, um, let, let's assume the, um, let me see what's the next slide says, what is the value 75, yeah. So let's assume it's 80%, okay? So let's assume you can take up to 80% of your deposit as a loan, right? So in this case, you're taking 66%. So you're locking in $100 worth of Ether into the deposit box, and you're getting uh, 66 um, coins, which are um, worth $66, okay? And then when you, you can use it, and then once you want to pay your loan back, you deposit your 66 die back, and then you get your one Ether back, right? So it's it's like you know any collateralized um loan so if you have a house and you want to borrow some money against your house you you know you lock your house and then you you get your house back if you pay the loan back right so it's kind of a very straightforward uh there is uh, some terminology so the terminology is that you are opening a um collateralized deposit uh, which creates the DAI, and DAI is this uh, the stable currency. Uh, and then when you're closing the deposit, you are unlocking the, the deposit that you put and you're getting your uh, one Ether worth back. So there is no magic here. Okay, what could go wrong? Well, you could probably not pay your loan back, right? If you don't pay your loan back, then you're not going to get your Ether back. Um, so your ether is sort of locked forever here and you are accruing kind of fees because there is a small, um, originally it was like half percent. Um, there is usually um, a small fee per annum that you have to pay for taking the loan, right? But what can happen is the price of ether can go down. So for example, in this case, um, you have uh, taken the loan of 66 DAI when the Ether was worth $100, but at some point, and, and you got the, the DAI into your wallet. But at some point, um, the Ether price is going down and it's sort of reaching, uh, it, it's getting closer to the value of your loan, right? And there, as, as I said, there is a certain, um, certain threshold. And then, um, where your deposit is becoming to be too small. I mean, it's not too small yet. You, you, you still have a positive difference between how much Ether is worth and how much your loan is worth, but it's getting closer to the to the one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. And that is very risky because if this ratio goes under, if your loan is lower, um, if your loan is higher than the value of your deposit, then you basically made money, right? You 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 scammed the system, so to say. So this situation should never happen. You should be, never happen that um, the amount of war value of the deposit becomes lower than the loan that you have. So when it kind of goes down to certain threshold, um, this um, uh, collateralized deposit is actually advertised uh, to you that you either have to top it up, you have to put more ether such that we are back into the safety zone, or uh, you have to pay your loan back. Uh, so you are giving a chance of either getting your, your ether back by paying the loan back, or you have to put more ether into the deposit such that you are in the kind of a safe margin. Um, if you don't do that, if you don't pay the loan or if you don't top up the deposit and the value of the ethers 
uh, drops even further. Your deposited one ether is being offered on an open market for anybody to buy. So anybody can buy this uh, one ether and the initial price is 66. It's like whatever your, your, you know, your uh, value was. Uh, and bidders can bid how much they want to pay. And because currently the ether is worth $75, if I buy it for $70, I can immediately sell it on the exchange and I can make $5, you know, um, $5 um, earning, right? I, I can make money. So this, uh, those collateralized deposits are open on for auction and people are bidding how much they are willing to pay. And if, if there is not, not many people bidding, then the price is quite good. Uh, so it's quite low compared to the current value. But if there are many people bidding, the price will kind of go close to the actual market value because whoever is buying it will still want to make money, but they there are other people who want to make money. So, you know, at some point, you know, the bidding kind of goes a little bit closer and closer to this until there is just one person left saying, yeah, I will still buy it for that price and sell it for that price, right? It will never go over the market value because then whoever is buying it will not make money. It, then it wouldn't make sense, right? So you can you can check um, MakerDAO um, auctions. So if you go uh, for collateral auctions, uh, no, they used to have, there is like a nice, yeah. Yeah, so. No, I don't want to liquidate this vault. Um, yeah, anyway, I need to go further, but you 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 have um an ability to actually check all those auctions which are happening. And of course, people are not doing it with mouse and watching it, they're doing it uh from the API and from browsing the, the auctions that are happening, and they have a bot which decides how much they are willing to pay and if the bot buys your no, buys somebody's um um deposits they immediately go to uniswap and they kind of are traded and and do some sort of money making um liquidity uh, providing services right so this mechanism allows uh people to, uh, I mean, it allows the people to make money on liquidations, but it also stabilizes this, um, the whole uh, loan and uh, uh, the stability of the, of the DAI coin. <clears throat> and as I said, it has been operating for many years and it has one instance when um, a market panic created a situation where not, um, that that many that, that the price changed so quickly that many deposits had to be liquidated very quickly okay so what will happen then what will happen when there is a market panic like in luna case there was a market panic the stable currency was packed to um luna tokens and then uh, or whatever the other kind of a non stable car the token was called and then this value went really down and then people kind of lost trust in the system. So they start selling. They start selling Luna and uh, the stable coin. And then the whole system kind of collapsed, right? So in here, if people are selling DAI and they are people who are um, selling the uh, Ether at the same time, so the price of Ether goes down and people don't want to hold DAI, what will happen? Well, uh, a market panic will happen and the price will become kind of shaken. Um, and that has happened once where the panic took the price of, um, so if, if, if again, if you look at the charts and check the charts of DAI, 
uh, versus, so if we go, yeah, I, I, I don't want to kind of go and search for it, but if, if you check it, there, there will be kind of a dip which bounces back, right? Um, and if you go to any, um, le uh, let's say DAX 40 index, so if I go to DAX 40 index, so that, that is a very stable German uh, economy index for um, for day kind of economy. Um, so as you can see, it has been kind of steady growing from 2000s all the way to now, and now the index is almost 18,000 18, points, right? But you can see this dip. You can see this dip and bounce back. What is this dip? Well, that's a market panic. So the market panic happened when Corona COVID happened and a lot of people were basically selling everything and they wanted to have cash to, I don't know, to do what, uh, but they basically were more people selling than buying anything. Uh, so the market happened, the market panic happened and then it bounced back. And you can see that it always is like this. You always have dips and bounces back, right? You have a panic and then it bounces back. You have a panic and you have it bounces back. So what happens to people selling here? Well, they lose money. What happens to people buying here? They will make money on the rebound, right? And that's exactly what happened with the uh, with MakerDAO. It actually um, behaved exactly the same as any other financial system. So the interest rate went really up. Uh, so whoever hold the money, they earned quite a lot. And people with capital, they kind of uh, made money on this panic. So they they were basically when waiting for people liquidating, they bought it really cheap. And then on the rebound, they kind of uh, sold with profit. So a lot of people with capital, who resisted the panic, they kind of made money. And those who went with the panic, they sort of lost money. Uh, it is kind of a zero sum game, right? Like those people who are, you know, selling here, are the earnings of those people are the, the losses of those people, right? So it, it's like, if, if somebody is buying or selling and making money, somebody was buying or selling and losing money. It It, 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 it is simple as that. So it, it basically happened here as well. And, that um, that happened once, but because it happened and people were a little bit unhappy of, of that it happened, um, they implemented additional uh, mechanisms such that uh, actually to prevent people giving in to, into panic. <laughs> so when there is a market panic, um, and it actually used to be like when I was a kid, I was interested in uh, uh, trading in the stock exchanges as well. And when I was a kid and I, um, there was a regulation saying if the asset changes uh, value by more than 10%, it is frozen for trading for 24 hours. You have to wait for the market to cool down, for people to stop making a very um, stupid decisions, right? Um, that has changed. So now uh, the regulations allow markets to swing up and down widely uh, over a span of minutes or seconds even. Uh, but in the past, that was actually being controlled. And as soon as something changed more than 10%, there was a kind of a freeze. So MakerDAO actually implemented it. So when there is a market panic, they basically make the maker contracts freeze for cooling off period such that people cannot really lose a lot of money and make a lot of money. People have to wait for the for the disturbance to kind of a pass. So things will kind of a cool, cool off a little bit. And that limits the amount of how much people can make money or lose money by this very rapid market movements. Um, so since then, since they kind of implemented it, it hasn't been used, but it is this extra uh, mechanism for um making sure that nothing super unexpected will happen um and then it is yeah self regulating it's very transparent it has a very small uh, interest rate um it you, you you kind of can get the loan against the crypto that you have 
and it pro provides this sort of a very efficient market for both for a stable currency against the US dollar and for the for the loan systems against uh, collateralized uh, collateralized deposits. Okay, so Ether has a self-regulating uh, supply. So Ether doesn't have a cap, but the supply and demand uh, regulate how much Ether is in the in the in in the uh, circulation currently. All right, any questions about uh, MakerDAO? Um, I I kind of went quite fast through the. Uh, through this, you can read a little bit more and you can browse the, the charts. They have quite a good um, overview of um, of the statistics for the MakerDAO and it's one of the yeah very solid success stories. And it's fully decentralized. So it is actually managed by community and you can um, buy a, a kind of a Maker to a token to be in the governing part of the of the protocol and be sort of uh, deciding on the interest rates and how things work. No questions? So the, yeah, there is um, a pool of, uh, so, so the contract keeps the interest. So the contract keeps the interest and I haven't followed uh, recently, but I, I think uh, some of the interest goes back to the owners of the maker token. Um, and some, some interest is basically locked in the protocol for some problems in the future if something happens. Um, I I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how much. Uh, what is the ratio of the of the value staying in the contract or being distributed to the token owners of the maker token? Um, all right. So let's move on. Uh, we will do one more topic today. So the topic is flash loans. Um, so this is super exciting uh, because it's something that doesn't exist in the real world. <laughs> you cannot actually have it in the real world because it require it, it would require um, a certain concepts that don't uh, make sense in the in the real world. Um, so imagine that you um, yeah, it is um, in the real world, if you want to take a loan, you you go to a bank and you say, I want to have a loan. And the bank will ask you for what? And you can tell them, oh, I want to start a business or whatever, right? But if you want to take a loan um, just for a single operation, and that operation can either succeed or fail. And if the operation succeeds, you will make money. And if the operation fails, you will it will like be like an atomic transaction, so nothing changes, then the money that you have will never be possibly lost. There is no risk. And we do have this. We do have in computer science, we do have those uh, database transactions, which are atomic. And it means it either the whole transaction kind of happened and all the changes are recorded, or it is kind of reverted back and that means nothing changes, not, nothing has happened, right? So with the decentralized finance and because we do have things happening in the, um, in the, on the protocol level, um, we can basically have a sequence of operations which are like this, I'm borrowing money, I'm doing some things with those money and then I'm repaying it back and all those operations, all those things happen in a single computer science atomic transaction. So it either succeeded, so I borrowed, I did it and I paid back, or it didn't happen at all, which means the money which I'm borrowing have no risk attached to it, right? Because I will only take the money, do this and pay it back if I can make money. And how, how I can make money, I can make money on uh, buying something cheaper and selling something more expensive, right? On basically this. 
So if I can see that I can buy a particular asset here, change it to this asset, change it to this asset and sell it here more expensively, I'm going to make profit. And by making profit, I will take the profit and pay the loan back. And I'm kind of doing it in a single sequence of uh, operations, which are atomic, right? So what it means is, um, Uh, uh, Lars is asking about is there is no fee for what for the flash loan you mean? Yeah, so for the flash loan, there is a small fee, but because there is no risk, the fee can be really really small. It is much smaller than half percent for the normal loan, where things can you know we we have much more to do, and also with the normal loan there is a kind of a time delay, right? So you're taking a loan for a certain duration of time, like a month or a year or whatever, right? And the money are kind of given to somebody for that amount of time. So let's say uh, I have 1 million krona and someone wants to borrow money from me. So I, I, I say, okay, you can borrow money from me, but you have to pay me in return because if I give you my million krona, I don't have it anymore. And I need to make money on my million krona. Right, so I'm borrowing you. I'm lending you. I'm lending you the million krona, but I expect, let's say, ten percent per annum in return. Otherwise, I'm I'm like I'm I'm gonna be uh, losing money because let's say there is a six percent inflation, and then I want to have four percent profit. So you know I cannot give you the the one million krona for free. So that there is a certain amount of whatever, right? But if you come to me and say, uh, look, Mariusz, I want to borrow a million krona for five seconds. <laughs> and then you have no risk of ever po possibly losing it. And I'm going to pay you back immediately. Like you give it to me and I, I kind of pay you back immediately. Then I can borrow it to you for very, very small fee because I can do it, you know, millions of times over the course of a day. Right. So. I don't need any collateral or any capital from the lender. Um, I There is actually currently no regulatory oversight how and who can take those flash loans. Um, it has to be repaid back in the same atomic transaction uh, in Ethereum or any other EVM. Uh, it is perfect for doing arbitrage or this kind of a liquidity uh, transformations and anyone anywhere can do it uh, with the access of internet, right? So what does it mean? It means trouble. Yeah, exactly. So you can write scripts. You can write scripts which search for an opportunity of making money. Uh, you're not creating money, you're making money by buying something from somebody cheaper and selling it to somebody a little bit higher. So normally there is actually nothing bad about it. Uh, you're just making markets more efficient, more you, you're making the spreads of uh, inefficiencies in the market kind of very, very small or non-existent by, by filling in the, the gaps. Right. So, yes, people do write scripts and people do search for an opportunity for arbitrage and they use flash loans to do this, uh, to basically make money on the price differences uh, between different uh, protocols or different uh, assets. Right. But what can go wrong? Well, um, you can. Um, Oh yeah, so th this is the liquidation auctions which I put a screenshot on uh, from the DAI auction. So you can see that there is um, BAT and AVE being kind of liquidated uh, when it happened and yeah, some statistics. And then you can decide uh, whether you want to buy the collateral or not and, and so on, right? So you're actually looking for this and then you say, yep, I'm going to take the flash loan. I'll, I, I'm going to buy all those liquidation things which are sold cheaper than the market value. And I'm going to sell them again and I'm repaying back in the single transaction, right? So you could use it for a liquidation auctions. You could um, you could use it for all those uh, inefficiencies in the market. But 
The bad thing is that you could also use it for price manipulation, right? So what happens if you have um, if you have a lot of capital, let's say, okay, um, and you buy all the Teslas which are which are being produced, uh, suddenly the price of Tesla will go up because people want to buy it, but you've already bought everything and you kind of have it. So now you can sell it kind of more expensive because people still want to buy it, but there is nothing left on the market, right? So if you do have a huge capital, uh, by buying something, you will kind of make the price go up. Normally, that should balance off. So let's say you bought something, uh, you, you bought a lot of something, so the price of it went up, but then you start selling it and whoever wants to buy it now buys it for this huge price, but the more you sold, the price will kind of uh, eventually go back, right? So in theory, by you buying stuff with the rising price and then selling it with the dropping price, you should not really make money. But you can manipulate, uh, in some cases, the markets in such a way that you create a panic and the panic will kind of make the price either fall down more than it should or go up more than it should. And then those people who are in with you with it, they those people are going to lose money, right? And you can kind of extract it. Yes, uh, that is true. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so to answer a large question, so you can do it for sort of uh, illicit or borderline purposes because sudden and, and anybody can do it because you don't really need capital. Like in, in the case of PS5, you actually had to have the capital first to buy it. Here, you don't need the capital because the capital is given to you for very, very small fee. Um, so anybody can do it and people do it like uh, a lot of people with a lot of time and internet access can just participate and do it. So um, there is a lot of um, a lot of abuse in DeFi because of the flash loans, because anybody can try to do things with the large capital, right? So in October 2020, uh, this uh, project has lost 30 million because they they, they had um, they had liquidity pools uh, between USDC and USDT, and the attacker they exploited the sort of the the price uh, latency of updating the price such that when they did the buy and sell cycle, they could make one profit. 1% profit, right? And they repeated it kind of a very quickly, multiple times in the single transaction, many times, hundreds of times, such that they can kind of exploit it until um, the service provider realized what was happening and could kind of fix it. So they um, they drained some of the money and then they used the Ethereum um, privacy uh, services um, to hide who they were and to, to launder the, the kind of money, right? So some people lost money. Uh, who, who lost money? Well, the liquidity pools are being supplied by investors. So the investors put money into the pools and they expect certain return on people exchanging money back and forth. Um, but if those pools are drained, some of the, the amount of money is kind of stolen, then when the investors want to recover whatever they invested, the money will not be there. So then they kind of lose money, right? Similar story with um, Saddle Finance in 21. Uh, so the liquidity providers lost almost eight Bitcoins because of the uh, three people, three arbitrageurs were kind of... Uh, manipulating the tokens and, and buying and selling them repeatedly over a period of time between certain stable tokens, supposedly stable tokens, and extracting kind of the fees or extracting, not the fees, extracting the value. Um, so, <clears throat> and flash loans attacks are responsible for over 50% of DeFi hacks, and that is true. Um, so flash loans can be used can be used for doing price manipulation attacks or for um, extracting some of the 
deficiencies of the of the protocols. Uh, so let me just finish. I, I don't have much um, to to say about this, but I have kind of a speculative speculative thought that uh, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, that anybody can play with large amount of money and exploit um, faults in the system because that means uh, the systems will be designed such that they cannot be manipulated with people with big amount of money, uh, which is not the case with current normal financial systems, for example. So those decentralized systems, they fall victim of the inefficiencies or certain um, safety checks, which were not resistant to people with a lot of money. Uh, and in normal circumstances, for example, with the case of the PS5, that's also the case. So people with a lot of money can do some activities which expose some deficiencies of the system. And the, the problem is not the people exploiting it, the problem is with the system. And then if this is exposed, then the systems get better. They have certain safety checks implemented such that those abuses cannot actually happen. Um, so that's what kind of I mean here that um, the attacks expose bugs or holes. And then um, if we don't have flash loans, then th those holes are still there, but they are just being exploited by people with a lot of capital, uh, not by anybody, right? <laughs> and that feels kind of unfair. Um, so um, the the side effect is that people do lose money, right? So exposing the holes costs some of the people money, which is unfortunate. Um, but those holes needs to be patched. If those holes are not patched, those people still lose money by, you know, by people with a lot of capital. Um, so it's, again, it's a kind of double-edged sword. Uh, it has a lot of negativity because people do lose money. Uh, but at the same time, the benefit is that those money goes into the exposing the holes and actually fixing it, which has a positive outcome at the end of the day. All right, so I, I will stop here. Um, we didn't go much into the technicalities. We will do it later uh, next in, in the next lecture. Um, and I will try to prepare uh, what the task is such that you get um, a little bit of an oversight. And if we cannot finish everything as I, I plan, we will kind of limit the task later on. But maybe I will, uh, I, I think the idea of um, releasing the task early is good because then you can start digging in and kind of planning what, what needs to be done. So I will try to do that for the next, uh, for the next class. Apologies for going a bit over time. Uh, thank you for participating and we'll see you guys uh, in the next lecture.